Wow, um, Andy, thank you for setting the expectations appropriately low. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and actually, while he was up here, let's just give Andy a round of applause for putting together just a remarkable day. Uh, with the possible exception of putting me after everyone else who was just did a fantastic job today. So, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the map and the territory, about the weight of the web, of forks in the path and the need for open, wide roads. But if you guys will permit me, I'd like to start things off in a slightly unorthodox fashion and tell you about somebody who has nothing to do with any of those things, and that is specifically my grandmother. Some of you might have heard me talk about my grandmother before and uh, written about her quite extensively, but she's just a really remarkable person. She's really shaped my life in a lot of ways. She raised me just about as much as my parents did. Um, so I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about her today, but the one thing I can't actually share with you is her age. Uh, my grandmother is a woman of, let's say, old-fashioned values, and if she found out that I told a room full of relative strangers, even though you're all lovely people, uh, how old she was, she'd destroy me the next time I went to visit her in Vermont. What I can tell you is that she was born in 1910. <laughs> I'm a big fan of mathematical loopholes and exploiting them for my continued survival. Um, but she's seen things and done things that, you know, she's told me so many wonderful stories over the years. Um, and, you know, her mind is still far sharper than mine is ever going to be. And she's just a really incredible, special person to me. And she became a little bit more special to me a couple Christmases ago when she handed me this, this modest looking uh, present wrapped up in newsprint, probably from that week's paper. And I opened it up, and I didn't really know what this was, because inside of it were these three sort of hand-sized books, all incredibly battered and worn. And like I said, I had no idea what these were, so I opened up the one you see on the left, which is the, uh, the most new-looking one. And inside of it was this index card that was just covered in my grandmother's impeccable cursive scrawl that said that these were her father's diaries. A man named Irwin Kelly, who until that point was just a name that I'd heard growing up, you know, on a couple stories around her dining room table. And these are very old books. I mean, the most recent one is from 1903, and the oldest one is from a full 26 years before my grandmother was even born. And I've got to be honest with you guys, um, it's almost three years later, and I still don't really quite have the words to sort of tell you just like what kind of a present this was. I've never gotten one like it before, and I don't think I ever will again. But I can start to get my hands around some of the parts about why they're so valuable to me. I mean, as a designer, I mean, there's so much to love. I mean, these are incredibly ornate, incredibly beautiful things. And especially for something that was mass produced at the time that my great grandfather would have bought at the local convenience store. But moving past the aesthetics, I mean, there's a lot to love here as an information designer as well. I mean, you know, there's uh, most of the front matter is actually dedicated to almanac data, information that would have been valuable to my great grandfather, who, like my grandmother, was a farmer. So there's uh, meteorological predictions, information about phases of the moon, pictures of naked dudes lounging around with baskets of fruit. <laughs> the Vermont winters were apparently milder back then. But the most valuable part of these diaries were the blank pages of my great-grandfather filled up with his own writing. You know, just short little updates that he dutifully filled in at the end of every day, just three or four lines for every single day of his life. And they're all basically like this. They're essentially just a little bit about the weather and then maybe one or two significant events about the day. This one is from 1892. Clear and very pleasant. Sent my hides, pelts, and skins to trage. Got the sleigh shod. All of these updates are incredibly short. They're very declarative. And they're also imperfect. Irwin didn't actually have a lot of education, so they're words that are misspelt, some that are crossed out and replaced. And all those imperfections taken in total, just it's impossible to tell you how meaningful they are to me, because they create this very real, very deep, kind of visceral connection to this man that I'd never met. Um, it creates a connection. I mean, I can almost sort of imagine him holding this book in his hands, filling it up at the end of the day, much as I'm now holding them in my hands over 100 years later, flipping through the pages of his life. And as I do so, I mean, these are more than diaries. They're really a map. They, they provide for me, at least, a pathway through his life with his updates, his short little updates about his life, acting as markers through this weird territory. It's, it's kind of a weird coincidence, but the first map that I ever saw was actually in my grandmother's house. Um, you know, because it was filled, and still is, I suppose, with these knickknacks, with curios, with toys that were actually probably left over from when her, her children were growing up. And she had, and I remember this clearly, perched on the sill in her living room, this cheap little globe. You know, it was nothing fancy, really. It was this cheap little affair made out of painted cardstock, sitting on the big picture window in the front of her house. And my brothers and I were just nuts about this thing. I mean, you know, that 
probably shows why I have no life today. But, you know, uh, we were just insane about this. You know, we ran our hands over the reliefs. We traced rivers and tributaries with these little, fat little fingers that we had, sounding out the names of countries that we'd never even heard of as best we could. You know, it was this flimsy, cheap little globe. It's paint flaking a lot over the years as we played with it. But I really remember it pretty clearly and fondly. There's a kind of magic to a map. Maps provide a sense of boundary, of scope. They give edges, a shape to what we know. You know, we explore an area, we chart its landmarks, and capture what we know about it. We document it. And in doing so, we create a thing, an artifact, that outlines and represents our understanding of that space. A little totem that we can hold before us as we return to a once strange territory. And as we do so, it makes it seem a little less foreign, a little less frightening. There's a story about one map in particular and the man who drew it, a man named William Fairfield Warren. Now, uh, before I get into this, it should be noted that the Reverend Dr. Warren has precisely nothing to do with the web, with design, or any combination thereof. But he was, in many ways, writing and working during a period of transition, much like we are. And as a result, I think there might be something we can learn from him. Because Warren was actually born in the United States, not far from uh, Boston, where I live today in the early 19th century and was, by all accounts, a pretty accomplished guy. During his 97 years, he became a teacher and a well-liked Methodist minister. And he traveled extensively, teaching abroad, before returning back to his native Massachusetts, where he was actually hired by Boston University as a professor of theology. And in time, Warren was actually selected to become the first president of the university and was actually instrumental in ensuring it became the first in the United States that was fully open to women. So William Warren was, by all accounts, an academic and a philosopher of some renown. But as accomplished as he was, much of his career was actually eclipsed by something that happened before it even started, something that happened actually on this side of the Atlantic. Specifically, in 1859, an Englishman named Darwin published a hefty little book with an unassuming title, namely, On the Origin of Species. It sort of rolls off the tongue. Now, the word should be noted, the entire world completely lost its shit. I mean, really, here was this persuasively written, thoroughly researched little book weighing in at around 500 pages that flew in the face of millennia of established theology. Because Darwin maintained that humanity had evolved over time, not from a Garden of Eden, but from decidedly less divine and decidedly more ape-like ancestors. Now, this isn't a talk about uh, evolution, theology, or spirituality. Or given another hour, I might actually be able to sort of extemporate on uh, Darwin's facial hair, which is really kind of riveting. Uh, instead, I'd actually like to return to William Warren for just one second, because his reaction is really interesting. Because he was, like many religiously sensitive academics of his time, left grappling with a rather pressing question in the wake of Darwin's book. You know, what was a modern, faithful person to believe? You know, he knew as an academic that evolution was beginning to shape humanity's understanding of the world and would continue to do so for, all time, for time to come. But as a minister, he wasn't simply willing to surrender his theology at Darwin's say-so. So as a man of science and of reason, he didn't either feel that he could simply dismiss Darwin's work out of hand. So instead, he actually went looking for Eden. Now, not in any metaphorical sense, mind you. Instead, Warren actually tried to reconcile his theological background to the science of this new modern era and to geographically locate the Garden of Eden, to pinpoint its exact position on the globe. And his method was actually fairly rigorous for what it was, because it had recently been discovered that the Earth was considerably warmer millions of years ago than it is now, or when it, uh, during Warren's time. And from that fact, Warren actually charted the location of the major archaeological discoveries of his time, you know, dinosaur skeletons, woolly mammoths, and the like, and realized that there was actually one conspicuously blank spot on the map. And so in his book, Paradise Found, he arrived at what was, for him, the inevitable conclusion. The Garden of Eden must be at the North Pole. So yeah, it, uh, it sounds a little bit weird, maybe ludicrous, maybe quaint, um, you know, talking about it now. But Warren was, like many of his contemporaries, caught adrift between two poles, between the divinely derived view of the world of his age, as he had been taught to understand it, as he firmly believed that it was, and this gradually more rational world that was emerging before him. And he felt as though he was a man caught adrift between these two perspectives. And to his credit, his hypothesis was a rather elegant attempt to reconcile the world as he knew it to the world as it would be. So rather than simply decrying Darwin's position, he brought a semi-scientific approach to the problem, and he brought maps. So in his time of transition, when one dominant way of thinking was slowly transitioning into another, Warren bravely tried to chart this new territory to make it feel more familiar, to provide a sense of scope and of boundary, to create an analog between the world as he knew it and the world as it was slowly becoming. 
So what would happen if we tried to create a map of the web? Well, as Mandy mentioned earlier today, it would look fairly different 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, than it does now. Because for the better part of the last two decades, we've been focused on a relatively slim notion of what the web actually is, designing for the problems and foibles of a handful of desktop browsers. And as we did so, we actually learned how to design for this strange new medium. Our vocabulary was actually borrowed directly from the conventions of the printed page. We spoke of folds, of composition, of widths. None of these are actually native to the web as it stands today. Our workflow even mimicked that of a printer's. We divided our work into discrete task-based phases, and you can chart the progression of a design from research to development, much as a piece of paper might work its way across a, a print shop from typesetter to press. But in time, our largest challenges felt like they'd been solved. Browser bugs gave way to the web standards project, to standardization, and eventually to an industry that was committed to quality, standards-focused design principles. Discussions of grid theory and typographic principles replaced discussions of compatibility and complaints about bugs. And yes, even time, uh, given time, even Internet Explorer felt manageable. And at that point, you know, every few years we sort of indulge in this greater discussion about when it would be appropriate to upgrade the width of our sites. You know, from 640 by 480 to 800 by 600 to 1024 by 768. I mean, it, it, it almost seems quaint now. But, you know, we had entered at that point, you know, this sort of grand settling out period, or that's how it felt to us, where browser bugs and best practices alike seem more or less final. Of course, as the saying goes, mobile kind of broke everything. But maybe it didn't really break everything. You know, it reminded us, as Mandy mentioned earlier, that the control we exerted over the web was really kind of an illusion as a consensual hallucination, as Jeremy Keith likes to call it. But today's device fragmentation broke that desktop-centric focus wide open and has most recently been the object of our attention and of our fascination. We're now keenly aware that our audiences are trying to bring their work, access our work, wherever they are, whenever they are, using these wonderful little devices we hold in our hands. And dutifully, we've striven to move beyond the desktop, first with mobile-dedicated sites and device-dedicated sites, and now occasionally with more holistic, more device agnostic approaches. A few years ago, I wrote an article proposing one such approach, something called responsive web design. Rob was kind enough to mention this earlier and actually gave a better description of it than I could ever hope to. But in the article, I sort of put forward that the three main ingredients of a responsive design begins first and foremost with a flexible or a fluid grid-based foundation, with images and media that work within that flexible context. And then finally, media queries, which are a little bit of pixie dust, I guess, from the CSS3 specification, that allow us as designers and developers to articulate how our layouts, those flexible layouts, can reshape themselves, can represent information, effectively responding to the changing shape of a browser window or of a device's screen. Responsive design is an attempt to embrace the flexibility inherent to the web, rather than simply seeing it as a liability, something to be constrained. So rather than siloing our work into device-specific experiences by default, we can instead, in the words of John Alsop, design across different device classes and contexts. We can instead design for the ebb and flow of things on the web. And I have to say, it feels really weird to be the guy talking about responsive design you know, over two years after this, because designers and businesses and publications and agencies that I deeply respect, people far more talented than I, have taken that really simple recipe, those three simple ingredients, and created these, these beautiful, flexible works of art. You know, thinking about what this fluidity native to the web actually means for them as designers and as developers. From personal blogs to small agencies to interaction-rich web applications that have thought about how you take these incredibly complex UIs and represent that information, making it accessible to screens of different sizes and different interface modes. Even content-heavy publications like the Boston Globe, like The Guardian, like the BBC, have begun experimenting with responsive design, but not just what it means from a visual or from an aesthetic standpoint, but actually talking about how they prioritize information across different contexts, how advertising might be impacted in this new flexible world, and what this flexibility actually means for them from an editorial standpoint, how they actually think about producing and delivering content for the web. Now, that's not to say that responsive design is the answer for every project, far from it. But in conjunction with the other techniques that we've adopted, we're beginning to understand what lies for us beyond the desktop, to develop a vocabulary for what design is evolving into, this new, weird, post-desktop landscape. And things seem to be speeding up. Um, research studies actually insist our audiences aren't simply becoming mobile-focused, but becoming digital omnivores who embrace multi-device browsing habits. That they interact with our sites throughout the course of their day using whatever device or devices they might have on hand. And understanding how they do that, how that cross-pollination uh, affects them, is really key to designing for today's web. That this notion of a singular mobile context makes about as much sense as a unified desktop context ever did. 
And in fact, Sumcast Mobile is sort of the next logic, logical progression in the web's evolution, and sort of a Darwinian take on how the web develops. That mobile is the truly next, uh, the next mass medium. That mobile devices are, at long last, the first truly personal computer. Always on, always with you, and always personalized. In other words, we've begun drawing a new map of the web. One that's colored not by our understanding of a handful of browsers or tethered to a specific location, and increasingly no longer defined by the constraints of the printed page. We're filling in landmarks of this new territory, marking them with sites both responsive and device specific. It's an exciting and kind of a terrifying time. But our work's only beginning, because as it stands, our map is far from complete. There's this really fascinating guy um, who was working in the middle of the 20th century, a philosopher named Alfred Korzybski, who was actually doing some rather beautiful research and writing around this problem of general semantics. Specifically, he was trying to explain this problem of the, there's a rhetorical divide between an object and a representation of it, and just how vast that distance could be and how it affects our understanding of meanings. To do so, he created this conceptual model called the map-territory relation. Let me give you a quick example of what he was after. So let's say I asked you to tell me about your morning coffee. I might be a little bit jet lagged, which is why I'm thinking about caffeine right now. You know, so nothing fancy. Just tell me about that first glorious shot of a wake that you got this morning. Now you might begin in any number of places. You might try to describe the physical sensation of the cup as you held it in your hand, the contours of it, or maybe the heat through your fingers. You might describe the taste, the perfect mixture of milk and grounds, that slow, smoky finish. Or maybe you thought of the friend who handed you that cup of coffee and some memories and events that you shared in the past. It doesn't really matter where you start. You could bring the full weight of your vocabulary to bear and speak for hours on end, painting as complete a picture as you possibly could, but something would always be left out. And of course, your answer would actually be different from the person who's sitting next to you. You'd each describe a different facet of the experience, choosing a nuance, a little detail, meaningful to you and you alone. We are, after all, slightly subjective creatures, which kind of compounds the problem, frankly. So as the saying goes, something gets lost in translation. But it's a very real problem, one that we face every day. In fact, the more words you use to describe that cup of coffee, the very thing of it, the more distance you draw between me and that experience. That moment is uniquely yours. And language can never, sadly, quite bridge that gap. This fascinated Korzybski, and he spent years researching and thinking about this, that the map is not the territory. Because according to Korzybski, the only true map, the only true representation of an object was one that could infinitely recurse. A truly lossless, accurate map would contain a copy of itself with all the fidelity and detail of its parent. And so on and so forth, that map would contain a copy of itself and so on down the line infinitely. Mapception or something. So instead, we're left with these imperfect, beautiful, but incomplete drawings, graphics that distill a region down to shaded boundaries, to place names, and rough geographical outlines. They're abstractions of a space, of three dimensions that have been flattened down and blunted to two. I mean, it seems obvious when you think about it that this piece of paper couldn't possibly capture all the nuance, all the realness of a city, of a country, of an entire planet, but I think it's something we tend to overlook. And Korzybski actually thought so too, and he was actually incredibly concerned about this, that we too often substituted the abstraction for the real thing, mentally speaking, obsessing over the map without looking up to understand the difficulty, the outright complexity of the territory it represented. So on the web, I think we actually have this problem, um, that the way in which we talk and write about the web falls prey to the same kind of abstraction. We speak broadly and with great certainty of what the web needs mobile versus responsive versus device specific and so on. Best practices in modern development or in design in UX or IA and CSS, JavaScript, web standards. And it's true, I mean, we work within a vast industry, an incredibly limitless medium. We need specialization, we need a vocabulary sufficiently complex to address it. But many of our assessments and a majority of our research, and in fact the bulk of our discussions that are happening today about the state of the web, are framed in decidedly Western terms. Our view of the mobile web was sparked by the iPhone and our imagination with it. And in some ways, I think both are very much still framed by it. We've mistaken the map for the true territory of the web, which is far, far more complex and more exciting than we might like to admit sometimes. Let's look at a map entirely. And actually, let's look specifically at one location, at Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. And Dhaka is actually really fascinating. It's officially classified as a megacity, 
a relatively new category of super metropolis, I love these terms, one that actually has both a large population and incredibly high population density. Dhaka has over 15.4 million inhabitants at last estimation, living within only 134 square miles. In other words, there are over 115,000 people in each square mile of the city, on average. Now, there are plenty of other megacities in the world, and some of them are much bigger population-wise, but Dhaka far outranks the likes of Mumbai, Karachi, and Kinshasa in terms of pure population density. Now, according to a survey conducted by The Economist, Dhaka was actually ranked as the planet's second most unlivable city last year, but this year it improved considerably after some significant investment and is now the sixth. But at the same time, during that same period, thanks to massive deregulation in the market, mobile adoption in Bangladesh has completely exploded. In 2011 alone, the number of internet users in Bangladesh grew by over 900%. There's an incredible amount of activity. It's really fascinating to watch. Now, distribution and access are still very much a challenge for many in the country, so most mobile use is currently concentrated in and around urban areas, Dhaka in particular. Now, even among the poorest citizens of the city, and there's a significant number of them, mobile phone usage is actually widespread. Many of the po most popular services focus on mobile agricultural exchanges which increase farmers' access to crop price information, improving their bargaining position with buyers, and actually affording them more choice, more portability, as to where and when they sell their produce. And what's more, mobile phones are frequently a public commodity, or at least a semi-public one, with vendors illegally at times renting time and data to those unable to buy a device for themselves. So there's that promise of access, but not necessarily ownership. I mention all of this because the World Bank estimates roughly 90% of the urbanization underway globally right now is taking place in developing cities like Dhaka. And in the next few decades, the number of urban dwellers in these developing countries is expected to more than double, to 5.2 billion at the last estimate con uh, conducted by the World Health Organization. So that is going to put nearly 75% of the world's seven, expected 7 billion urbanites in cities of the developing world, cities that look quite a lot like Dhaka. So by a large, large margin, the next wave of urbanization will be happening in what we traditionally relegate to the developing world, on devices that are far less powerful than ours and are often far from personal. In other words, our de definition of the mobile web, in fact, of the web in general, is changing. It might be changing pretty dramatically. And this isn't isolated to DACA. Let's take Africa, for example. In recent years, Africa has actually seen an incredible continent-wide rise in economic productivity, growing faster than East Asia, including Japan, in eight of the last 10 years. But from a more web-centric standpoint, things are seriously afoot in the continent. This year, mobile penetration in sub-Saharan Africa hovered around 60% and is actually estimated to hit 75% of its population within the next four years. The continent has more than 700 million mobile phone users, far outpacing both America and Europe. Nearly a tenth of America's landmass is actually covered by mobile internet services. In fact, more people in Africa have a mobile phone than access to electricity. But despite that, or actually perhaps because of it, Africa has, in many senses of the word, leapfrogged, leapfrogged our model of the web, our understanding of it, yoked as we have been by the desktop. It's frequently cited as a model of a truly mobile-only ecosystem. Mobile financing and payment systems are considerably farther advanced than ours happen to be right now. Mobile has more advertising in Africa than traditional media, whereas in many parts of the world, most notably in the United States, we struggle to make mobile advertising work at all. But of course, in many regions of Africa, their version of mobile doesn't neatly map to our definition of it. Just as in Dhaka, mobile phones are often not personal devices, far from it. Instead, they are treated as a communal resource shared among an entire village, for example, or again, as a commodity to be leased or rented. Now, both of these things are changing, of course. Next year, the price of smartphones is expected to reach affordable levels in the continent. But for now, rapid urbanization and the explosive popularity of cheap, web-enabled devices has painted a dramatically different picture of what the web means for them. Now, there are a few uh, great examples of what their, my, their web might look like. For example, Hatari, which is a service that allows Kenyans to report bribes and corruption by email, text, or by tweet. Then there's Mimi Board, which allows users to create geospecific alerts, which they call notice boards, relevant to them and to nearby friends and neighbors about traffic alerts, lunch specials, or the like. And then there's Mmaji, which is actually really a wonderful thing. This, its name means mobile water in Swahili, and it's a service designed to improve access to clean water among some of the poorest people in Africa. Using an SMS-driven interface, Nairobians without access to clean water can actually connect with nearby water vendors and compare prices and rate their service. 
Doing so allows them to avoid the normally day-long search for water in some parts of the continent and avoid vendors who exorbitantly inflate their rates. Now, what's remarkable about each one of these systems, each one of these services, is that they're uh, accessible via the web or via SMS or, in some cases, via older protocols, protocols like WAP. But they share one characteristic. They are all designed for reach, for access. This is by far and wide emblematic of the most successful services in Africa, systems accessible to even the lowest level of devices without compromising the experience on the higher end of the spectrum. Now, it's easy to write off the developments in Bangladesh or in sub-Saharan Africa as being unique to a developing ecosystem, sort of relegate them to a different space. But I think what's actually happening in these areas is in many ways emblematic of an emerging new normal for the web, one that presents us with an opportunity, uh, an opportunity and a challenge to revisit much of how we think about how we define design for the web. Let me put it another way. An overwhelming percentage of the world's population is coming online as we speak today, in this moment, using devices far less powerful than the ones in this room on networks much slower but no less accessible than the ones that we traffic. So what does that mean for us and how we build? And are we ready for them? I started this talk with a story about one map maker. <clears throat> now I'd like to tell you about another. Specifically, a man named John Randall Jr. Now, we don't actually know much about Randall. Um, in his early years, we know that he was born in Albany, New York, during the latter years of the 18th century. And eventually, he became the protege of a man named Simeon DeWitt, who was the Surveyor General of New York State, and eventually became one of New York City's three street commissioners. And this is where Randall's story actually begins. Because in the last years of the 1700s, New York City was actually less than half the size of modern-day Belfast. Its population hovering around, I think, uh, 125,000 people. Most of that population, however, was actually concentrated on a relatively small percentage of Manhattan's 33 square miles, huddled around the lower tip of the island. North of that point, expansive estates were actually held and occupied by private owners. Now, as a result of a recent surge of immigration, the most populous parts of the city were actually something of a mess. A tangled jumble of narrow, irregularly plotted streets and densely packed lots were actually proving unsustainable and, frankly, unsafe. It was proving incredibly difficult and nearly impossible for the city to provide reliable fire control, to police the area safely or well, or to prevent the spread of disease. Now, the city's government actually realized that some, city, uh, some civic planning was sorely needed. They began a few initiatives to survey existing streets and make some recommendations as to how the city might reshape itself to better sustain growth for the future. So after a few failed starts, in 1807, the city council formed the Commission of Streets and Roads to establish a comprehensive street plan for Manhattan. Their efforts were overseen by three commissioners, Simeon DeWitt among them, and John Randall Jr. was actually appointed the commission's chief engineer and surveyor. Now, Randall and his colleagues were, let's say, not loved by the landowners of New York. Um, they were frequently arrested by the city's sheriff for trespassing, sued for damages after pruning trees in, uh, in condu conducting their work, and attacked by dogs sicked on them by property owners, irate at the prospect of streets being plowed through their properties. In one incident, Randall re recounted how he and a team were accosted by a female vendor who hurled epithets and produce at them in equal measure. And I love the idea of retreating in the exact reverse of good order. Um, the man was probably seething a little bit. But Randall actually worked tirelessly and uh, ceaselessly, and he actually became something of a local figure among the populace. He was often seen walking the entire length of the island over the course of the day, and he would carry a long board with him so that he might cross small ravines as he's conducting his work. And as he walked, he actually planted marble monuments or iron bolts in the ground behind him, leaving them in his wake to denote where an intersection would eventually fall. And over the course of four years, in the spring of 1811, Randall's work was finally finished. So he and his team actually produced three copies of a map, um, and each copy was nine feet long by 30 inches wide, a map that defined New York City's now famous layout. This was a system of 12 named or lettered streets. We're going to have to wait for this whole tr new transition to go. It's impressive work. But this was a system of 12 named or lettered streets running north to south, parallel to the island, each intersected by 155 numbered streets costing them east to west in a perfectly orthogonal grid. So Randall had created this from this unruly knot of streets and irregularly shaped plots. He had designed this kind of life-sized Cartesian coordinate system. And it's fairly remarkable. 
Now, I don't want to imply that the commissioner's plan went, you know, perfectly. Um, there were, of course, the aforementioned incidents of cabbage tossing and dog chasing and sheriff arresting this. But once construction of the grid began in earnest, the city actually garnered a reputation for being notoriously unaccommodating of existing properties. Estates were divided, hills were leveled, and rivers filled in. Houses, farms, and even a hospital were actually raised to make room for the new streets. It was estimated that two out of every five establishments on the island were actually destroyed in the process and were simply what the locals called being mapped over. What's more, it actually had its fair share of aesthetic critics. Civic planners and architects alike actually derided Randall's strict adherence to a grid as unimaginative and woefully geometric. But given all that, it's actually incredible just how much Randall's system was designed for use, for access. I mean, even the commissioner's language announcing the new plan highlights this beautifully. Randall and the surveyors were tasked with creating a plan that was first and foremost to be livable, to better facilitate the creation of the habitations of men, and in an economical fashion by favoring straight-sided and right-angled houses, which are identified as the most cheap to build and the most convenient to live in. In fact, the missive of the 1807 commission was, in short, laying out streets in such a manner as to unite regularity and order with the public convenience and benefit, and in particular, to promote the health of the city. Whereas William Warren was using a map to make a new land seem less foreign, the Randell map was actually attempting to define a new territory, to solve a problem, to establish a vision for New York City as it could be, filled with plain and simple reflections, as they were called, that could unite regularity and order, a map that illustrated a territory that could, in effect, better serve its residents. In facilitating cheap construction, by virtue of being accessible and easily navigable, the city grid, aesthetically unimaginative though it might have been, is a system that becomes beautiful through use through service to its inhabitants, effectively to promote the health of the city above all things. So I wonder if there might be a lesson here for us or something to consider as we move forward, as we plan our path through our medium's own growth that's happening all around us. Because with the relatively recent explosion of inhabitants, there are a lot of parallels between today's web and the congested streets of Manhattan at the turn of the 19th century. Because not two years ago, the average size of a website was hovering around 320 kilobytes. And as of September of this year, it's over, well over a megabyte. One megabyte, 1,000 kilobytes, one million bytes. I learned math yesterday. <laughs> but I mean, damn, I mean, for perspective's sake, I mean, we managed to place the first manned rocket on the moon with 64 kilobytes of software. Or in a comparison nearer and dearer to my heart, the average Nintendo Entertainment System cartridge weighed around 256 kilobytes. But those comparisons, while cute, are a little bit beside the point. Our work has trebled in weight, nearly 300% growth, and in less than two years. While Moore's Law has been charting exponential development of mobile devices, faster processors, increased memory, and expanded storage, the one area it hasn't taken, and in fact has been slightly disproved, is bandwidth. According to a recent study by Ericsson, the world still overwhelmingly favors cheaper, lower bandwidth data connections, thanks in part to the most populous emerging markets, uh, bandwidth connections like Edge and GSM are by far the most dominant means by which mobile users connect to the internet today. This will change, sure, but it will take time. Because projections actually estimate that by a wide margin, these lower end networks are going to dominate the landscape for the next five to six years at least. So we have portability now, but not necessarily power. But regardless of the capabilities of the device, each one of these promises access, and that's what we have to serve. Now, it's tempting to see this bandwidth problem as you know, something that's unique to mobile devices, or perhaps argue that we need to be doing less on the smaller screens. But I don't think that's quite right. I think that this is an opportunity for us, and kind of a wonderful one, if you think about it. Given how much of the world's population relies on this lower range, um, I think we're entering a rare moment in which we can begin a conversation about sustainability in web design to plan not only for adaptation to various devices, but to responsibly design in such a way that promotes future growth, that enables access. The BBC have actually been experimenting with responsive design in public for well over a year and documenting extensively. They've been doing some beautiful, beautiful work. But in their experiments, they've invested heavily in this old, well-tested notion of progressive enhancement, ensuring that access to their content is a promise made and a promise fulfilled on any browser, on any device. Now, the experience around that content, however, will be tailored to meet the capabilities of the device, no matter how capable it might actually be. 
because no matter how advanced or primitive that device might seem to you or I, by using a simple little test of the browser's capabilities, they're afforded access to either the basic or an enhanced version of the design. When John Alsop urged us over 12 years ago to design for the ebb and flow of things, I realize now that he wasn't just talking about layout, though that remains a first and important step, the first marker on our map, as it were. Instead, I think we need a new definition of what constitutes beautiful as it applies to the web, one in which our success is defined not just by how visually compelling it is or arresting it might be, but by how broadly our work is accessed and one that embraces the wonderful fragility of our medium. We need lighter pages, yes, smaller frameworks, more focused content, a greater push towards clutter-free interfaces. But I think we also need a greater awareness that at any point, any element of our design might not survive a trip to the person attempting to access it. There was a wonderful article in a list apart recently written by Paul Robert Lloyd called The Web Aesthetic, in which he's arguing that we need a new definition of what an aesthetic might be as it applies to the web, one that's actually defined by our medium's strengths as well as some of its perceived weaknesses, like image compression, for example. He argues, as we enter the third decade of the web's existence, we should be gaining a sense of what works and what doesn't. We should be inspired by the conventions of other media, but no longer governed by them. I think that's exactly right. I mean, the web is just over 8,000 days old. And it's important to note, though, that much of this aesthetic, much of this de definition of beautiful that I think we need, moves beyond visuals beyond what we traditionally think of when we speak of design. I mean, for its own part, a progressively enhanced approach allows the BBC to manage a ridiculous amount of complexity just by itself. But their work is also a grand experiment in letting go, of relinquishing control to the idiosyncrasies and limitations of the myriad browsers and devices available to their readers, but ensuring at the end of the day that that basic promise of access is always fulfilled. And they're able to do so without sacrificing speed or aesthetics, both the, both the high and low versions of their design are, in their way, beautiful. And they show we can deliver content, deliver information to the least capable devices, but intelligently chart a path to that higher end. I think it's interesting to contrast this to our re recent interest in, say, high pixel densities displays, or retina displays, if you like. You know, since Apple released the iPhone 4 a couple years ago, we've spent a considerable amount of time and resources working to ensure that we can support both high and low end resolutions. Apple.com is actually a fine example. If you visit it on a retina display, you're automatically upgraded to a higher res experience. But now you're silently downloading twice the artwork, one for the standard design, and then conditionally, a bunch of higher resolution versions of those same images, all for a page that now weighs four times its original size, just over two megabytes. Now, many solutions catering to retina displays do so automatically, just as Apple does, by detecting the capabilities of the device and enhancing the experience automatically. Now, doing so solves the problem, as it were, but it does so independent of any awareness of not just the user's connection speed, which we can't reliably detect, but of other contextual cues as well, like their monthly bandwidth allotment or costly overage fees. And these are things we can't possibly hope to detect. Now, this is not to suggest that supporting retina displays and high-density screens aren't a good and important cause to discuss, but I think our current approach to providing that support are indicative of a larger challenge that we're still constrained in many ways by the printed page. Not by layout, <clears throat> we're working on that, but by that promise of perfect fidelity and design, that what we set down is what's seen by our readers, by our visitors, by our audiences, that the visual elements we craft and the styles we write, the complex behaviors we develop, will each find their way perfectly and flawlessly to the browser. So whether it's retina-ready images or web typography or JavaScript or any of the more involved and exciting aspects of our work, I think we often forget just how fragile the delivery of those elements can be. Because our work is, by definition, lossy. When we design for the web, we surrender so much control over our design to those who view our work. A connection might be lost. Network latency might be too high. There are so many potential points of failure when we design for the web, and our current methods need to embrace that awful, wonderful fragility. A few years ago, back in 2003, a man named Matthew Chalmers was talking about this tension between design and implementation as it pertained to the design and deployment of wireless networks. He was excited by this promise of ubiquitous computing back then. And he was writing that specifically in any design system, there will be seams, areas where, say, the signal might degrade or coverage might stop altogether. Now, I think it's safe to say that as designers, those seams are often seen as issues to be repaired or problems to be addressed. 
But Chalmers, however, argues that these seams may in fact have value to the user. She may, for example, seek out a network's weak spot to focus, to find a quiet moment offline. Or conversely, she will seek out the stronger areas when she needs to complete online tasks. By exposing the seams to the user, by communicating them, she can take advantage of them. And that's what Chalmers was arguing. When we communicate the seams in our work to our users, they be, they're no longer bugs. They're features. Given the all that we don't know, all that we can't solve, I wonder if we might practice a more seamful version of web design ourselves. As an example of this, back in 2011, Craig Maud wrote a wonderful article for List Apart called A Simpler Page. Now, in it, he announced the release of a suite of templates called Bibliotype intended to facilitate beautiful reading experiences on the iPad, and they are beautiful. They're exquisite pieces of design and engineering, but as he was talking about his process, Craig actually admitted that there was one problem he couldn't solve. Namely, no amount of code or ingenuity on his, uh, his part would allow Craig to determine the distance of the user's eye from the screen. And from a typographic standpoint, so much of the design should, ideally, follow that. So instead, he exposed a few controls to the reader. They could then select from a few different modes to further customize the reading experience, allowing them to select from bed, knee, or breakfast, uh, different modes that were basically a way of describing the tablet's distance from the reader's eye. Now, style switchers aren't new by any means, but the application here feels especially timely to me. Craig invited the user into the design, affording them control over the experience. In other words, he identified a seam in his work, he exposed it to his readership, and in doing so, he made it valuable to the reader. It's patterns like this that seem especially relevant right now, given that the number of problems we can't solve is expanding rapidly. For example, Filament Group in Boston works with a significant number of financial clients. So much of their time is actually spent designing information-heavy, data-saturated tables. And a responsive design and a completely flexible layout, tables are actually challenging even when you're only juggling a few columns. So they realized they could actually invite the user into the design and partner with her to solve this problem. Filament set some smart defaults in their responsive design, showing and hiding certain pieces of data, certain columns at specific breakpoints, at certain screen sizes, but then allowed the user to easily override those defaults to make the table display information that was valuable to them in their unique, their singular context. Now, I realize there's something in this that might make us a little allergic to invite our user in, to showing preferences so visibly in our design. Maybe it's just me. But if you think about it, there's a fairly rich tradition in doing this. As we begin to move beyond the desktop, we invited them to choose between two paths, between desktop and mobile. And as a user made that choice, the landscape would change dramatically, almost seismically, presenting different content sets, different features, and different designs. So I wonder if we might be able to find something a little bit more nuanced. So rather than simply giving our users control over cosmetic aspects of our design, maybe we should give them more control, look for more seams to expose to them, so that we can instead <coughs> you know, offer them an option by, let's say, we default to a low bandwidth friendly experience, but then allow them to tell us whether they want a higher fidelity experience with the retina images and the like based on conditions as they see fit during times when it would be valuable to them. I don't know that this is the answer, or even if there's one singular answer as we move further and further beyond the desktop. But I do know that with all the complexity we manage, it can at times be a strength to admit what we don't know and to ask for help. There's a wonderful quote by Andrew Stanton. It's okay to not know, to be wrong, to screw up and rely on each other. Art is messy. And what is the web if not messy? You know, our job as designers, as developers, as builders, is to make as much order of that chaos, that mess as we can. But we should embrace the entropy a little bit too. Because while we can craft these beautiful experiences, we should also remember that the most appropriate solution to our problems might be held by the person on the other side of the screen. Because after all, yes, we are builders, but we are perhaps more importantly the map makers, the cartographers. We are capable not just of outlining a landscape, but of reshaping it as we see fit. That's an awesome, terrifying responsibility. But it's a wonderful gift as well. So as we leave this beautiful room at the end of this wonderful day, filled with thoughts and ideas just as radiant and new, let's begin sketching a new map, one that outlines a web designed for reach, accessible by all, no matter what part of the territory they may live in. Thank you very much.